be focusing upon verses 13 through 15, but I'd like to read a little more of the context. We'll begin with verse 11, and we'll read down through verse 23. Again, remember, beloved, as I read, these are the words of God. We break into the the missionary journey of the Apostle Paul that's recorded for us here. Therefore, sailing from Choraz, we went, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. We were staying in that city for some days, And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us, And cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when his masters saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. They brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or to observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. We give our attention this morning in particular, as I said, to verses 13 through 15, where we read of a particular woman named Lydia who walked worthy of the Lord. A woman. And we note that here are some firsts that we can learn that accompany the salvation of this woman recorded in this passage. Lydia is the first soul to be saved in Macedonia, which resulted from the first time the gospel was preached by Paul or by any other that we know of after he had sailed from Troas. And after Lydia was saved, Her home became the first place where the Christians of Philippi met regularly. So this then, beloved, is the first church that we know of in the whole of Europe. Quite a significant event. It's easy for us to read these few short verses and just skip over this. But we ought not. Now there are a number of parts to it. Uh, this passage, but we'll focus on three this morning. We note, first of all, that the setting here is the Sabbath day and the praying of the women in Philippi. That's what we note in verse 13. That the Apostle Paul went out to try to find these people. We learn that. And he found a group of of women gathered along the river, and one of them was named Lydia, of course. 
But who were these women and why were they meeting at the riverside outside the city? Again, the key to that is verse 13 is because it was the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was a day set apart to be holy, of course. And for God's people, when it is the Sabbath, they want to find time to worship the Lord. And so these women met together regularly so that Paul could even ask in the community and people would point out, well, if you want to find some, you know, people who are praying and gathered on the Sabbath, go out by the river. There probably was a mix here of Jews and Gentiles. It's primarily a Gentile city, though. And we could even ask, well, why didn't they meet in the synagogue? Because if you know Paul's ministry throughout Acts, whenever he went to a city, he immediately went to the synagogue. Well, it's easy to answer is that Philippi didn't have one. There were not enough Jewish families there to have one. The rule was that you had to have at least ten heads of family in order to have a synagogue. And if you had them, then all the other Jews from other communities would help for you to build one there. But there wasn't one. And if there's less than ten, the only thing you could do was meet together on the Sabbath in an open-air meeting, one just like that, one that they were having that's recorded there by the river. A Sabbath day meeting place provided a place for these devout believers, believers as much as they knew at least, to join together. And of course, there was water there where they could have their ritual washing of, of hands and face and feet. And if I ever get the opportunity to show you pictures from Nepal, you'll see that when we have meetings there, the people gather. One of the first things they do is they go to the source of water and they wash their hands and feet because they've traveled many, of them, many miles to come and they're wearing sandals and their apparel is much like it was in the day of the Lord. And of course, uh, it's popular today to think, oh, wow, what a neat thing to do, to worship outside and be by the river. Wow, that's really cool. Why don't we do that? The millennials love that. They're, they're skewing organized religion. So uh, maybe we can catch a few of them down by the river. Where do you have to go? What's the closest river here? Kasumnas or Kasumnas, however you say it. There you go. Start a prayer meeting there. See what happens. Well, of course, this was not just some fancy thing they were doing because it was, you know, cool to that era. It wasn't that at all. It's what they had. In fact, the river that's located by Philippi was a mile and a half from the city at that time. That's no easy journey, and what would the weather be like? It would often be blistering hot. Now, you think about that. How would you like to meet alongside the river in Modesto in July or August? You wouldn't like it. You'd at least have to have a tent or some kind of shelter. Now, this wasn't done for fun or some reason like that. They were there because they wanted to worship the Lord. Now, verse 14 mentions that Lydia had come from the city of Thyatira. That city had a proper synagogue, so she was used to it. It's probably where she worshipped every Sabbath day. Yet when she came to Philippi, where there's no synagogue, she didn't mind the discomfort and the inconvenience of attending the Riverside prayer meeting every Sabbath. It's sad when you hear of people that they just stay in a particular assembly to worship because of the nice building. They don't want to give up the beauty of a building and sometimes even after the gospel is left. And that's a sad thing indeed. Many Christians today have to meet in places and conditions that are most unconducive to worship on Sunday. And of course, as I say, it's... it's very typical in many areas, much like Nepal. 
come on a mission trip and you can meet with us. Sometimes we're in cow pens. I've worshipped in a barn in Egypt or even on the side of a hill or a pond or along a river, wherever God's people are meeting. You want to go where hearts have the opportunity to be open to the gospel. Not so much the outward conditions, but where people are hungry for the things of the Lord. That's what you want to see and and hear of. Are they hungering and thirsting for the things of the Lord? Certainly true of Lydia. We read that her heart had been opened, and so she was set upon worshiping God. A mile and a half walk wasn't going to stop or quench her spirit. In verse 14, it describes her as a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. Of course, that expression, who worshipped God, is not as familiar to us in the sense that it literally means a God-fearer, a God-fearing woman. It wasn't just exclusive to men. And the detail of verse 14 shows us what a God-fearing woman like Lydia was by her occupation. She was a seller of purple. And Thyatira now was about 300 miles east of Philippi in Asia Minor. There's still a city there today, though it's in Turkey. And what made Thyatira so famous at the time was the expensive cloth that it produced. It was said that a juice from a certain kind of shellfish was used to dye the cloth and get this very rich, deep purple color. It was said to be worth its weight in silver and gold. The Romans especially treasured it for their garments, the wealthy Romans, to show off their wealth. And of course, Philippi was a wealthy city. It was a trade city, and the Romans controlled it. So she was smart to go there. She was a clever businesswoman. Philippi was a center of trade on a major highway that spanned across the whole of Macedonia from east to west. And this meant that she had excellent prospects to do a very profitable business, much like the woman of Proverbs 31, right? She knew how to buy and sell. Not property, but cloth. So she had come to a very strategic city. And we're told in verse 13 that instead of, though, doing a prosperous business in the city on that day, Romans didn't care about a Sabbath rest. She's at a humble prayer meeting outside the city. A woman who is willing to forego all the profits she could make. We need hear nothing of her husband. Maybe she was a single Mother, providing for her family, didn't matter. More important to her was the worship of God. Now, and at that time, beloved, except for the Jews, most everyone else conducted business on Sundays. There was no setting it apart, no weekly day of rest in pagan or Roman culture. Only a few public holidays they had during the year. This meant that the day when Lydia worshipped God was a regular working day, a day when she could have easily worked and prospered, selling her purple cloth. Now, what is our attitude concerning the Lord's Day? How important is this day to us? Is it only for Presbyterians and Reformed people? No. What did Jesus say? Very simply, the Sabbath was made for man. In the broadest sweeping sense, everybody needs a Sabbath rest. Now, I had the privilege to work my way through school while I worked at General Motors. It says, hey, I'm originally from Michigan. I worked the GMC truck and coach division. And I remember one particular con confrontation with a fellow and he was kind of in my face and they were wanting to have a shift come in on Sunday and I go no I don't I 
I'm not coming in. I don't want to be there. And uh, one thing led to another, and he got into this whole thing. Well, I can understand that because I don't like to either. Sundays are mine. I said, well, why don't you go to church then? And well, he really got upset then, you know. Well, that's my day to do whatever I want. I said, why don't you work seven days a week? Why do you have a Sabbath or one day off that's Sunday in the United States of America? Did the light bulb go on to let you know it had to do with the Christian influence upon this nation, which is greatly denied today? It certainly is. In Michigan, when I grew up as a boy in the, in the 50s, on Sunday, everything stopped. The stores all closed. You might have one pharmacy and one gas station, and that was it. Alcohol could not be sold after midnight. The bars were closed. I'm not doing it today, I know. Well, we scoff at that now as blue laws. How about a regard for a Sabbath rest? Now Sunday, the second busiest shopping day of the week sad. Let's gauge our own church attendance by our commitment to Christ. Will our children and our children's children know? One thing they know of mom and dad or grandma and grandpa is that you're always going to find them in church on Sunday, as we like to say. Worshiping God on the Sabbath. Remember that it was a great film, Chariots of Fire. And Eric Little was a Scottish Olympian who could run like the wind. The film so well captures that. And having the, the uh, Prince of Wales come and try to conjole him into running on Sunday because when he found out his event was going to be on the Sabbath, he says, I'm not going to do it. Oh, they were upset with him. You've got to do this for... For king and country. He says, no, I have to serve the living God. He's more important than king and country. And he wouldn't do it. And of course, many were very disappointed with him. But they talked him into it. He said, well, he would run a different race. He would run the 400 meter, which he wasn't used to. No one expected him to place in the finals. But just as he was on the starting blocks, somebody slipped him a piece of paper. And on it was a quote from 1 Samuel 2.30. Them that honor me, I will honor. Of course, Little went on to outrun all the others. In fact, he broke the world record at the time. 47.6 seconds. Well, not falling into legalism, but we need more Littles and Lydia's. And stop making excuses of why we do not give ourselves wholly to the worship of the living God. Invite people. Come and worship. Come and know who God is. We're here because we want to come into the very presence of God. Because God demonstrates often in the midst of his people what? His saving power. And that's what you see that happened at that humble little prayer meeting at the side of a river near Philippi through the conversion. We really only know of one lady that says, Lydia, that God opened her heart. The saving power of God's word. And he sat down with them, it says of Paul in verse 13, and spoke to the women who met there. And in verse 14, it tells us, out of all the women, it says, a certain woman, you see how God singles her out in his word? A certain woman named Lydia. Now, I'm not an egalitarian in our roles. I believe God has given us distinct roles. There is a true biblical headship of men. And that role of servant doesn't mean he's better than a woman. In essence, in our relationship to Christ, we are all one, equal. 
Paul made it clear, didn't he, in the preaching of the gospel? There's no Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, male or female. We're all one in Christ. Yet God singles out this woman, and I want to encourage all of you, no matter how insignificant you may feel at times, and sometimes women are made to feel of lesser importance, and that's wrong. That God has a place for every single one of us in his kingdom. And it's not a matter of, of whether we're male or female. Who he uses and who he saves. The Lord opened her heart. God did that. And he singles her out. It brings clear though as well the sovereignty of God in salvation, doesn't it? God opened her heart. It wasn't Paul who opened her heart using clever words and a, a, a tricky argument. He set forth the gospel. He explained what Jesus had done and accomplished on the cross. And out of the sovereignty of God and salvation, we understand why the glory for our salvation belongs to the Lord alone. In order to be saved, our hearts need to be opened. Which means nothing less than to be regenerated. That means a new heart. The Old Testament prophets preached, circumcise the foreskins of your hearts. Well, your hearts don't have foreskins. It's using a metaphor. There needs to be a radical change. There needs to be a cutting away of the old so that the new would come forth. And this only happens by the power of God. In Ezekiel 36, 26, we read, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Again, metaphorically, God didn't take this physical heart out and replace it with another physical heart. But there was a day when he changed this heart. Because my natural heart was leading me to destruction. That's what we are born with. There needs to be that second birth, new birth. And that's what transpired with Lydia. An inward change took place. With this new heart, what does God do? He gives us the power to overcome sin and to be able to follow after him, to live a life that's pleasing to God. That's not a works righteousness. That's a, a, a matter of God's grace being affected in the life of a person. And in the case of Lydia, having this new heart enabled her to understand the gospel and to become a believer of Jesus Christ. Even though she had been worshiping God faithfully with the other women as a God-fearing woman, that alone would not save her from sin. She still needed to have that personal faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There are many people who are religious. You might even call God-fearing. But does it mean they know the Lord? Many people, they attend church services. Some even pray and, and fast. But without saving faith in Jesus Christ, they cannot be saved from their sins. They need to know the Lord. That's the issue. To know him and trust him alone as their Lord and Savior. Because we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that word of God is a sharp sword, we're told in Scripture. It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. You see, all the external things, we don't know that a person is converted just because they can, you know, follow certain 
order of worship, certain ceremonies, certain rituals. Those are outward things. It's an issue of the heart. Jesus made it clear in his Sermon on the Mount. It's not what goes in a man's mouth that defiles him. The outward is what comes out. Where your heart is, there your treasure. And we know the word of God is the means that he uses. In the case of Lydia, God used the Apostle Paul to be that messenger to bring the gospel to her. It's interesting to see how God used the various circumstances to bring both of them to that same place. Now you remember, Lydia wasn't from Philippi. She was from Thyatira, which, as I noted earlier, is located in the province of Asia on the western part of Turkey, 300 miles away. In those days, that 300 miles is a lot further to travel. Now, we made it over 100 miles to get here today, and we did it in less than two hours. How convenient. But for them, 300 miles was days and days journey. And then the Apostle Paul, you know, he was directed by God a little earlier in the passage you read that he was told not to go into Macedonia where he had planned. He was going to go to Thyatira in that area where Lydia was from. But God directed him. And remember we started out reading, he went straightway to Samothrace. Straightway he went there. When God told him to go a different direction, he went and the only thing we see happening there is one woman being converted. But that's not insignificant. God often uses one person. And he doesn't take the high and mighty of this world, does he? It's often the cast off, the low, and those of unimportance. And Paul went. There he meets Lydia. And then amazingly, we read in the book of Revelation, Thyatira is included as one of the seven churches of Asia, isn't it? How did that happen? Paul didn't go there. Maybe Lydia went back home and shared the gospel. We don't know. That's speculation. But we do know Thyatira now has a church by the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. God does them work in wonderful ways. And don't despise anyone, no matter what their station of life. Certainly not male or female, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, bond or free. You know, David Livingston, that famous name for a Scottish Presbyterian missionary, Sometimes I think more of a cartographer than a missionary. He wrote maps of Africa. But tell the story of Robert, his father-in-law. Thank you, dear. Still helped me after 42 years. Robert Moffat was called to preach and share, as I often do, go to a local church, tell them about the work of missions in Africa. And it's a rainy night, typical for England and Scotland. And it's a midweek service. And he, he says, there's not going to be anybody there but a few old ladies, you know. And he was very downcast. And he said, who am I to question the Lord's providence here? I'm going to go anyway. I'm going to preach as if, it's the queen, as if the queen were there and a thousand people. And he goes, and sure enough, small assembly a few elderly ladies, but little did he know that while he preached, a young lad was pumping the organ downstairs. And that young lad was David Livingston, who heard Robert Moffat preach, and it touched his heart to be a missionary. Of course, he didn't know he'd also become his son-in-law. Don't despise the little thing. God's ways are higher than our ways. Even Paul's imprisonment of Rome was ordained of God. Sure, we would 
pray for him if we heard that, you know, Paul was in prison and we were alive at that time or anybody today. We often get requests that people are in prison, pastors in Iran, in Pakistan, and now happening in Nepal. More and more opposition from the powers that be. But when Paul went to Rome every morning, a new soldier of the Praetorian Guard was chained to him until the Praetorian Guardsman had Paul under his custody. He would have him for 24 hours, and then he'd have a new guard. They didn't want any familiarity, and they would change over. New guard, new guard, new guard. And some might say, oh, look at that. Here's the great Apostle Paul, and he only gets one guy that he can talk to about the Lord. Well, that one guy turned out to be the entire Praetorian Guard. That's like the special forces for Rome. And then we wonder why we hear of people being converted in Caesar's household. We can't despise any circumstance that God would use for his glory. Paul could say, God has enabled me to preach the gospel to the whole Praetorian Guard. That was his testimony. Who knows how many pagans in Rome were converted through Paul's faithful witness by being chained to one guard a day. God works in marvelous ways. People come into contact with his word, and when they hear it, let's be faithful that we witness carefully. If there's anything you do in talking to somebody about the Lord. You may feel very discouraged after talking to them. Like, oh, it was just terrible. We got an argument. Always end it at least by encouraging them. Read the Bible for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Please, read the Gospel of John. Or read Mark. Encourage them to do that. That God might work in their hearts to open them to hear the Gospel. And so we learn of the sincere fruits of Lydia's coming to the Lord, being God's workmanship created for good works, Ephesians 2.10. That certainly happened for Lydia because we see that the first fruit of Lydia's own baptism, of course, baptism doesn't merit somebody's salvation, but every true believer ought to want to be baptized the response to the Great Commission, if you will. She's not ashamed to confess her faith in Christ publicly. And she, as it were, goes back home, and we see in verse 15 that Lydia's entire household is being baptized with her. So infectious is that work of grace in her heart that she wants to see it active in the hearts of those that she loves. It may have included her husband. We don't know. We don't hear of him. But certainly of children and servants. That's a household. A wonderful occasion it must have been. Of course, in verse 33 of this chapter, we see another wonderful occasion. That's when the Philippian jailer is converted. And then he and his household are brought to be baptized. The question is, What are we doing to see that our own loved ones are coming to Christ? Are we speaking to them of the Lord and his saving grace when we have opportunity? There's plenty of evangelistic resources available. If we feel so, you know, tongue-tied that we can't speak to them very well, well, you can give them... CDs and DVDs and flash drives and all the modern conveniences. You can buy someone a Bible who doesn't have one. Encourage them to read it. Have a Bible study in your own home. I knew of ladies. One lady in particular was having a Bible study. She was up in her 80s in her home in Philadelphia, teaching neighborhood ladies the five points of Calvinism. I always found that as uh, interesting, but she understood. She was teaching them the doctrines of grace that they needed to understand. And then you note further fruit with Lydia. 
was her hospitality of Paul to Paul and those who were with him. She said in verse 15, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, there's the standard, come to my house and stay. Of course, she had to have a room large enough. There were at least four men in Paul's entourage, Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke. Wouldn't have been easy just for anyone to do. And she didn't simply say to them, if you ever need a place to stay in Philippi, let me know and I'll see what I can do to find some lodging for you. No, she says, we, I want you to come to my home, to my house. And Paul writes, so she persuaded us. She was not going to have anything else. Lydia persuaded them to stay in her house even though they, had been, they could have politely declined the offer. You see how this shows the the sincere sincere desire on her part to serve God. Of course, having the gift of hospitality means you have the opportunity to fellowship with God's servants. It demonstrates that she was beginning to develop her Christian virtue of brotherly and, if you will, sisterly love. Do we find good fellowship with other Christians? In our own house. It's very special when you invite someone into your home, and especially to share a meal with them. There's an intimacy to do that. We are told in Scripture to, to be hospitable, and you know we have the opportunity that we could even entertain angels unaware, messengers from God. Think of the privilege through the years of many that I've had the opportunity to stay in our home and to share a table with. Lydia apparently opened her house for such a purpose. In verse 40, we see a little later on in this passage, so they went out of the prison. Paul and Silas, you'll recall at the end of our reading today, they got thrown in prison because they had been involved in the conversion of this girl who had been demon-possessed and threatened the income of those who were using her. But when they came out of prison, what did they do? It says they entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. By this time, a number of believers in Philippi had increased, including the family of Lydia, the Philippian jailer, a slave girl who had been delivered by, from this demon possession. Lydia's home became the very first place in Philippi where Christians met together regularly. So we could say it was the first house church, if you will, to be planted in the whole of Europe. Of course, later on, that congregation would grow large enough. Paul would write to Philippi. It would have its own elders and deacons. And it would even give generously to support Paul's ministry in the future, where you read in Philippians 4, 15, and 16. All of this was possible because God used an ordinary woman called Lydia. Nothing more is mentioned in the Bible about Lydia after Acts 16. And yet, what a great impact her encounter with the Word of God had in her own community at a humble riverside prayer meeting because the Lord, the great cardiologist, if you will, the one who can work on hearts when nobody else can, opened her heart and produced results in her life, in her family, in Philippi, and perhaps even Thyatira that neither Paul nor Lydia could imagine. Who knows what may be produced by your encounter with the Word of God and sharing it with others. Don't forget, wherever you are, when you meet people, the opportunity you have to share the Word of God, the Word that has come to you to tell you that through faith in Jesus Christ, all your sins are forgiven. 
Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And your house. As it was testified to Lydia, to the Philippian jailer, and others. Let us pray that the Lord would open the hearts of our loved ones who do not know him. And I always think as moms and dads, it's not merely the training, but also the praying that you have for your children. It's so important. Because unless the Lord opens their heart, all of our training will be of no avail. So we need to remember that always. Now I want to leave you with an illustration to show a little bit of the impact that we not, might uh, be mindful that it's never insignificant whenever we share the word of God with people. Never. A New Herbides chieftain sat peacefully reading the Bible. New Herbides is in the South Pacific. Scottish Presbyterian missionaries evangelized there in uh, 1800s, 1900s, turned many from cannibalism to loving the Lord. And he was interrupted, this, this chieftain, while he's reading the Bible. A French trader had come by and he said, Bah! Why are you reading the Bible? I suppose the missionaries have got a hold of you, you poor fool. Throw it away. The Bible never did anybody any good. Replied the chieftain calmly, If it wasn't for this Bible, you'd be in my kettle by now. Indeed. We as a people need to remember for our own society, our own nation. The blessing the word of God has been to us as a people. And not to shy away from it, even if this generation would gnash its teeth upon every time they hear the Bible or the name of Jesus Christ. They gnash their teeth in Jesus' day. They gnash their teeth at the apostles. And Fallen man will always respond that way unless the Lord opens his heart. Let's pray.